So I'm going to give you some things today that you can help focus towards the sports industry in the way that we talk and act and look for things. Because I think there's a certain point of view that comes from working in the sports industry, and that's a big part of it. This is the Work in Sports Podcast. Coming to you on a Wednesday, but doing a Monday-style interview where we're going to answer one of your fan questions. We've had so many good fan questions come in lately. I like to answer those with some level of urgency because I know sometimes that you guys are really looking for answers on where you are right now, but the advice can help a lot of people. So let's lean into some of those questions. Before I get started on this one, which I really like, please, 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 I can't stress this enough. I don't know if you got a chance to listen to Amy Anderson, head of content strategy at NASCAR's interview from last week but it's amazing. One of my favorite conversations, she dug into great advice. She talked about her journey. She talked about getting started and networking and skills she looks for now and building up her leadership capabilities. So many great pieces of advice in there. Amy Anderson, head of content strategy at NASCAR, our last week, last Wednesday's episode. So, so, so worthy. Such a great, great, great woman and so much to learn from her. So please go back and listen to that one. All right, let's get into the today's question from Neil in Boston. Hey, Brian, I'm a 25 year old who really loves your show. I graduated with a finance degree a couple years back and really am not happy in my career. I want to change to a sports career and I'm putting together my plan to get there. My question for you is, is a sports resume different than a traditional business resume? Neil, this is a really good question because I do think there are some distinctions. I do think there are some different things we can lean into in your sports focused resume and how we want to structure things a little bit. And I'm going to get into all of those things today. I will tell you, your traditional business resume, if you follow some of the best principles that I tend to talk about a lot, and we'll rehash a little bit today, if you follow the best principles of writing a resume, even if it's in a traditional, you know, standard business kind of format, you'll do fine. What I'm talking about today is the 5% change, 5% difference. The sports industry tends to be very competitive. A lot of people applying for the jobs who are qualified and interested in these roles. 5%, 1%, tiny little percentages can make the difference. And so I'm going to give you some things today that you can help focus towards the sports industry in the way that we talk and act and look for things. And then that might make that slight difference over that person who has a more standard uh, resume. But I'm going to get into this one theme first. It relates to this conversation, but it's just something I have to step out on a little bit. I hire this wonderful company, purchased work in sports last year, two years ago now. Oh my gosh, two years ago. And it's amazing, awesome company. There are 57 different versions, essentially, of work in sports within iHire. Uh, iHire ophthalmology and iHire accounting and iHire finance, you know, all these different industry-focused communities. And so a lot of our high-level conversations in an organization will talk about trends in the industry. And I keep hearing and being shared articles and being talked to about the shift to skills-based hiring across industries and what that means for hiring and employment. And I'm sitting there thinking, skills-based hiring? What? Like, yeah, we hire based on skills. Isn't that the game? Isn't that what we always do? So I I start to do a little bit of research on my own. I'm starting reading some of these articles and and looking into things. And I see a Harvard Business Review article, very well written, well articulated, but I'm sitting there like pulling my hair out. This article was from their research saying is that employers are now favoring hiring on the basis of demonstrated skills and competencies. And I'm like, now, now that's what we're focused on. What have all these other employers been doing? Because the sports industry has always worked that way. When I first broke into CNN Sports Illustrated, a lot of us used to make this joke. We used to say, you know, if you're going to get hired to do work in sports video production, you should have to prove that you know sports and video production, like not too far of a leap, right? The idea that you would have the skills that match the industry demand is something I've been preaching for forever. You're going to be hired based on what you can contribute to the organization. So I, my mind was blown a little bit thinking, what are all these other companies doing? Well, what it turns out when you dig deeper into this concept is that a lot of industries have not been hiring based on skills. They've been hiring based on what school that you went to. They call it degree inflation. And I didn't really hear this term because I don't think that really happens that much in the sports industry. Sometimes there'll be a certain school program that may elevate you a little bit, Right. In the sports broadcasting world, Syracuse, Missouri, those are some schools that really stood out in our niche. But I don't think that was the only reason people got hired. They got hired because of their skills, and those schools did a really good job at developing the skills. So it all kind of still fits back towards skills. What I'm finding from talking to 
other industries, reading other articles, et cetera, is that most organizations were hiring based on where did you go to school and what are your exact educational qualifications? And what this does is it lessens the opportunities. A large population of potential employees are being overlooked because they don't have the degree necessary or the de- there was an inflation of demand of what a good degree means. They went on to do further research of the middle skilled job descriptions were reviewed. This is a Harvard Business Review. 37% showed no reduction in degree requirements. This year, this was just published recently, which means that some 15.7 million people have effectively been walled out of the candidate pool, even as employers complain bitterly about the unavailability of workers. So think about that. Employers are saying, we need to have people with this standard of degree program, and we're not going to hire anybody less than that. And then they're saying, but we can't find anybody to hire. Like, just focus on what people can do and can contribute. Again, I think the sports industry has always operated this way, and all of you should think this way. Understand the skills that are in demand. Cater yourself towards them. Learn those applicable skills. That's going to be the kind of stuff that stands out on a resume, and that leads us into the rest of this conversation. Skills-based hiring is the sports industry. Sports industry has always been a meritocracy. If you can do it, if you can achieve, if you can show what you can accomplish— Our industry rewards that because I think there's a certain point of view that comes from working in the sports industry, and that's a big part of it because sports are a meritocracy, right? If you're the best player, you play. Same concept as best employee, best at getting the job done. I'm not looking at your resume anymore. I love this. Okay, I'm going too far on this probably, but this fires me up. So Bill Belichick always says after the draft, he's like, I don't care if you were the first round pick or you were an undrafted free agent. From this point forward, none of that matters. How you perform out there on the field is how you will get playing time. And he'll cut first rounders and he'll elevate undrafted free agents. And I think that is the way that our sports industry works. Have merit, opportunities will follow. I think that could have been a podcast in and of itself because I do think this is a really important concept for everybody to understand. But now it's leveraged just into the concept of resumes because getting across that skill set is so important, but also layering it in with the way we speak in our industry, I think is important. Before we get into that, I'm going to go one kind of layer really a little bit deeper. Now, Neil, this doesn't probably apply to your situation, but I think it is important for those people who listen in our audience. We have a lot of student athletes that listen to this show. Not all of them want to work in sports, but we speak their language here. Uh, so they come here looking for sports advice, like for career advice. So I'm going to give this to them. And I think this, this audience needs to hear it. Student athletes have a different experience. They might not be able to do as many internships. They might not be able to do as many volunteer opportunities. They're traveling, they're training, they're competing all year round. It's different. But that doesn't mean you don't have opportunity as a student athlete. For one, you should always leverage your ability to make contacts within your athletic department because you have an in, but a lot of the other students don't. Talk to the different people about career after sports within your athletic department. Do some volunteering off season. You can start to do internships right there on campus. You can train for a while, then you can do internship for a while. You know, you can really try to get a, a good amount of experience. But as it goes for your resume, include your athletic participation in a separate section. You may have a work history section. Include athletic participation as a separate section of your resume. Include the sport you played, the years you played, the accomplishments while playing, time devoted to training weekly, monthly, off-season, on-season, however you want to articulate it, and then any academic awards or honors that you achieved despite all of that extra work. This shows an extra layer of context about you. It tells them a little bit more about your story. I know a lot of employers that are very driven to student athletes. They're they're drawn to them because they know that they're mature, dedicated. Time management is very strong. They have leadership skills, accountability. They're willing to be coached. These are all things that are really important. So again, employers are looking for that. Make sure you leverage that on your resume. Include athletic participation in your resume. Additionally, If you've received a full athletic scholarship, I would include that as one of your accomplishments. That, again, shows that dedication has lasted in a level of accomplishment and and attention to detail and reaching for goals is part of your DNA, how you're constructed. And that's what we're looking for. You know, what can you what can you do? Who are you? I would include in your entire resume and cover letter soft skill focused action words, meaning. Describe the skills you've gained from participating in college athletics, leadership skills, teamwork, time management, communication skills, commitment, loyalty, 
All of those things go a long way in explaining what you'll be like in the workforce as well. So while your resume may look a little different, you might not have as many internship experiences or as many volunteer experiences or many skills-based opportunities. This will help you raise the bar by showing a little bit more about how you fit into your potential in in a workforce. Now, let's move to the more advice for everybody, because not everybody here is a student athlete. Certain terms really resonate with sports people. Use them and cite examples. Here's what I mean. Every job that you have and you have on your resume, every experience, whether it's an internship or a full-time job, your bullet points will elaborate on what you did, what you accomplished. I'll get into the nuance there in a little bit. But I also think you always hear about action verbs and certain terms you should use. And I tend to be like, eh, wishy-washy on the action verb stuff. You hear them enough and you're like, whatever. It's just another word you pulled out of an ebook. But I think for the sports industry, if you can give examples of teamwork, if you can give examples of competitiveness, of coachability, of loyalty, of dedication, these are things that resonate with those of us in the sports industry. So again, if I'm reading your resume and I read one that is a little bit stale, a little bit boring, maybe doesn't have a ton of personality to it. And I'd read another that isn't like being cheesy and over the top, but is layering in some of these terms, that's going to stand out to me a little bit better. If you're giving examples in your work history of an ex- of a time that you leverage teamwork in a team project or to back somebody else up who got sick or some sort of an example there, that works in the sports industry. We're driven to this industry because of these attributes. So leverage those moments and those words and those phrases that stand out in our industry. Number two, if you aren't using numbers and data to emphasize your accomplishments, start over. Again, using the idea of you have a job or an internship, one bullet point should layer in something about teamwork or coachability or loyalty or something of that. One bullet point should have a data metric in there that shows what you accomplished. Like, give me an actual result here. It could be sales and revenue, quota, calls, uh, goals, social media engagement rates, email marketing, open rates, profitability, operation, lowering operational costs, performance and operations, executed a high touch Twitter campaign that raised followers 29% or whatever. I'm, I'm, I'm spitballing some things here, but you should have a metric in each job to show what your major accomplishment was and proof of concept that it did something to move the business forward. Going one layer deeper on that, I'll bring up number four, which is to me, one of the techniques you can use on your resume that I think really resonates with the sports world. We often talk in the marketing world about, um, problem slash solution creative, right? So you present a problem and then you show the solution that you bring to the table in copywriting and marketing landing pages. That's the kind of way we operate a lot in videos we create. Here's a problem you face. Here's a solution. You can use a similar technique in your resume and we call it, we call it car. It's, it's challenge actions results. You'll hear some people call it STAR method. I've done a podcast before on the STAR method. It's just a different acronym. You've heard other people maybe call it SOAR. It's just different words to get in there. I like challenge actions results because it's very easy for me to remember. Once you get to STAR and there's four words you have to remember, too much, right? Kind of kidding. Anyway, my point is challenge actions result. What was a specific challenge or situation facing the uh, your organization or and or your team, whatever, What actions did you take to meet the challenge and improve things? And what were the long and short-term results that positively impacted the company? If you can work that into a statement, a bullet point, a one or two sentence, that works for our industry. We like challenges. Oh, you faced a problem, you came up with a plan, and these were the results? That's my language. That's how we work. Implement this style underneath your work history in any any of those moments to you've got metrics in there. You've got a little bit of your personality of what you've accomplished and using some of those key words we talked about that relate to the sports industry. And then you give me some challenge action result and accomplishment member and your result to always use those data points as well. So you can start to combine and, and do some of these things, but these are your checkpoints. Did I do this? Did I execute in this way? The great thing about thinking through this challenge action results process, it also pro- prepares you for the interview process. If you're thinking in this way of challenge that I faced, action I took, results that I get, that's a story you can craft and tell 
during your interview as well. It might be, you might be start doing this thought process and this research and into yourself and crafting some of these and think, man, this might make a really good cover letter too. So it's like one piece of content, your challenge, your action result that can benefit you in multiple ways. Cover letter, resume, uh, interview process, a lot of ways you can start to leverage this information. Number five, no one size fits all. Okay, I say this a lot. You got to do this. Customize your resume based on the job itself. Make changes, change keywords, add things in, re- read the tone of the job description and mirror it. You know, if they're saying certain things in their job ad that they're looking for and demanding, make sure you mention those. Make sure maybe maybe you have five different examples of those ca- challenge action results and you kind of work in the right one for this job or employer. Like you could have a database, you could have a, a spreadsheet or a Word doc with a bunch of different challenge action result type stories from all your different work experiences. And you can go to that and pick it out and say, oh, that one would really fit here. It matches the tone. It matches something that's important to them. They're talking about social media metrics. I have a good social media story. You know, that kind of thing you need to be very thoughtful about. So no one size fits all resume. I just blasted out to everybody. You got to be more intentional than that. Find the right data points to match, find the right tone to match, find the right uh, skills to match, and that's how you're going to stand out. Number six, can we make resumes interesting? Your resumes need to be an interesting read and give a feel for your personality, period, full stop, bottom line. Like I am so tired of reading the same resume over and over and over and over and over again. Everybody starts to look the same. It is okay in our industry to show a little bit of your personality. Do not go over the top. Do not be crazy. Do not start bragging about your knowledge of the 1974 MVP of the AL MVP. Like, it's not that. I'm saying you can put in some personality towards your accomplishments, make things stand out. I'm going to get into formatting in a second. That's going to be the last point of this conversation. But I have seen people use a technique that we use often in marketing landing pages. So if I'm trying to, let's say that we've created this great report. It's a data report. We did all these surveys. We know the reasons people are hiring in the sports industry. We actually call it the state of sports hiring. It comes out in August. It's a great report. But nonetheless, let's say we've created that and we want you to come and download it. The marketing landing page that we build, the page we want you to land on and make this choice, we include logos, we include testimonials, we include some copy that gives a spirit of what you're going to get from this. Take that same kind of marketing concept to your resume. You're building your personal brand. If you have a testimonial from somebody that raves about you, rather than saying references available upon request, put it in your resume. Quote them. If you have a job that's with these NFL teams, put the logos in your resume, okay? Now, it's not going to be for every version of your resume. I'm going to be really clear about this. I'll get to this next. But put these things in there that make it eminently visually interesting and easy to read, compelling. I'm intrigued. It's a story. It uses terms that are like the sports industry. Show a little personality in there. It's okay. Having a little enthusiasm for sports, having a little... Passion, excitement, it works in our industry. Don't be afraid of that. That might not work in other industries. It can and will here. Now, the last point I want to make, no matter what industry you're in, I want you to customize your resume each time. But I really want you to have one version that is that really pretty formatted, looks designed elements kind of of resume. It's visually appealing. Don't put your photo, but you can still design it. That is for when you are attaching to an email and sending to a person. That's for when you're going to a career fair. That's for when you're handing it to a person. That that is beautiful and, and well thought out, right? It is not for when you apply for a job online. When you apply for a job online, the first thing that you're, it, the computer system is going to do, it's called an applicant tracking system, is strip out all that formatting. So if you have columns or if you have pretty shading or if you have you know pretty logos in there, that will confuse the computer systems. Because it makes it into a text-based document and it's going to have gobbledygook file names in there and it's going to read from left to right. So if you have columns, the sentences aren't going to make sense. You have to have a version that is stripped down and made for the ATS. The information is the same. It's just a stripped down, computer-based, this is what I want them to see version. That is not just for the sports industry. That's for whatever job you are applying for. So my point in this conversation is, yes, there are things you can do that will raise the bar for you in the sports industry on your resume. There are subtle differences to how you do a sports resume. At the same time, there are some best practices, and I tried to get into those. Using metrics, 
not one size fits all, creating multiple versions of your resume specific to the job and multiple versions, one for the handing to somebody, one for the ATS. Everything else I talked about today was about the sports industry resume. All that stuff, you put it together and your resume is going to be better than most people's. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed a Monday episode on a Wednesday. I'll talk to you all on Monday.